Hope you'll all be able to hear me all right today. I'm recovering from one of these uh, voice bugs. And my, last week I could sing, I think, one, maybe on occasion, two notes. And so I have degenerated somewhat since then. I'm not quite able to, I mean, I've improved a little bit since then. I think I can sing three or four notes today. So uh, I'll have a go at talking to you this afternoon. Mr. Armstrong is uh, away on his out-of-autumn hunting trip, which he has had a tradition of, I guess, for 30 years or better. And uh, several of them have gone up tonight. They're enjoying their camp. I hope they have weather like this today up there. It will be beautiful. Uh, but they often, they're always camped out. They finish setting up camp on Friday, and then they spend the Sabbath sort of sitting out in the sun and, and uh, just reading a book or relaxing or walking off by themselves up in the mountains. So it's an unusual and a very rewarding way, actually, to spend the Sabbath up in the beautiful environment in northeastern, northwestern Colorado, where they are today. A lot of us who were in the Worldwide Church of God before we were in the uh, Church of God International feel sort of hard done by by the way that we were treated or the way things were done. I remember at the first Feast of Tabernacles in 1978 down in Jekyll Island, the most common expression uh, was, well, I've been burned, followed closely by, well, I w I've been hurt, and people were pretty bad torn up by an awful lot of the things that they had been through. And I must say, not without justification, because a lot of things that happened uh, shouldn't have happened. People were treated in ways that they shouldn't have been. But on a historical scale, you know, when you really lay the thing out in historical perspective and you look at the things that we might have experienced, really our affliction didn't amount to very much. It really wasn't that big a deal. Now, somebody might say, what do you mean not that big a deal? Uh, you know, I, I got cut off from my family, and people of my own flesh and blood wouldn't speak to me, and they will regale us with this, the accounts of all of the things that they were put through. But I still say it was really no big deal. And I'll explain to you why I say that. Religious oppression is nothing new. Sometimes religious oppression is spiritual and philosophical, that people try to intimidate one another, they argue with one another, and it's on a philosophical level. At other times, it becomes very real, and sometimes it even becomes downright violent. I never cease to marvel at the lengths to which men will go to suppress beliefs and ideas that are contrary to their own. It's astonishing sometimes to realize what people will do. Men will inevitably use, there's another one of Dart's axioms, men will inevitably use whatever power or weapon they have at their disposal to enforce their beliefs on other people or to suppress beliefs contrary to their own. Now, if the only weapons they have at their disposal are, for, shall we say, reasoning or philosophy or debate or explanation or argumentation, that's what they'll use. And, in fact, that's to some extent what we do. And here I am today, you know, trying to impress an idea that I have on your mind. I'm trying to do so by reasoning, by analysis, by citing Scripture, by explaining that scripture to you by using illustrations that I have at my disposal. Here I stand before you an illustration of exactly what I'm talking about. Whatever power I have, I will use to try to convey my beliefs to someone else to get them to believe what I might believe. Now, if you take a step further than that and you put into a man's hand certain types of sanctions which he may exercise against other people, he will inevitably tend to use that power and those sanctions to try to suppress beliefs contrary to his own or to convey or impress his beliefs on someone else. It may be uh, excommunication, you know, economic or social sanctions. For example, I tell you that if you don't agree with me or if you do not accept this or if you will not do this, then you're not welcome here anymore. Not only are you not welcome, you're not going to be allowed to attend here anymore. And I'm going to tell all these people not to speak to you, not to have anything to do with you, to cross the street and avoid you if necessary, to hang up if you call them on the phone and have nothing to do with you. Give me that kind of power, and I may not use it today or tomorrow or the day after that. Sooner or later, though, I will use that power in order to defend the truth or to impress my ideas on someone else. Men do that sort of thing. You give them the power to put people in prison, and sooner or later they're going to put people in prison. You give them the power of the Inquisition, the, the, uh, the ability to take people prisoner, the ability to hold them, 
to make inquiry, to investigate, to interrogate, to torture, and eventually even to kill to protect the truth. And sooner or later, men are going to do that, too. In the 13th century, I don't know, in that year there were many other times when things like this took place, but back in about the 13th or 12th century, some monks were actually burned at the stake because they believed and taught that Jesus and the apostles owned no property. Does that shock you? Here was their belief. Now, these were, uh, you know, they were just monks. They went around with their, their, their very common, very ordinary habits on, a little hood over their head, and they went from town to town. They accepted money from people or food or what have you just for their existence. They owned no property themselves. And they were teaching, you know, uh, they had had for themselves, and they taught poverty. And so they went from place to place, and they claimed as a fundamental doctrine that Jesus and the apostles owned no property themselves. Now, I think they were quite mistaken in their belief. But is that the sort of thing that you would burn somebody for? You know, stick him up at the stake and light the fire at his feet and burn him. It happened. Now, of course, you have to understand there's a little more to it than that. What these men were really doing was quite political in nature. It was an attempt to undermine the authority of the Pope and those bishops who, in the view of these monks, were heaping great wealth to themselves. They felt that the degree of wealth that the papacy was, was acquiring was obscene. They felt that the avariciousness of bishop, the selling of indulgences, the, the uh, terrible financial and moral corruption that was existing needed to be answered somewhere, and their answer to it was poverty. The church and its leaders should be personally poor. And to some extent, uh, among Roman Catholics, that view pervades even to this day in the sense that many priests do not own anything themselves. They, they live in, in uh, a house that's provided for them, and they themselves are relatively poor, and, of course, there are those, even to this day, who do take the vow of poverty. But the church suppressed quite violently, in fact, in this period of time, the idea of poverty among certain religious groups. Or certain, and, and it's surprising, really, to learn the extent to which the Catholic Church in medieval times was uh, sectarian, that there were groups or monasteries here and there who held different theological precepts, which at one time or another were anathematized by the pope or the bishops, but, of course, there were times when we had popes anathematizing other popes. So there was nothing particularly unusual about that. But it was a very violent and a very dangerous time. This was a time in which if you were accused of being a heretic and you were called or ca captured or taken in for the Inquisition, you might just as well have written your will or your last will and testament and written off the remainder of your life. For once the accusation was made and once you were in the hands of the Inquisitor, there probably was no way out for you at all. Because when you were there and you began to deny the accusations against yourself, the denials were considered as confirmation of the accusations. And you kept on denying, and so finally the decision was made, well, we're going to have to use torture to get at the truth. Now, what was commonly done was the person who was being interrogated was kept and humiliated, first of all, for a long period of time. And humiliation was a very, very important part of the tools used by inquisitors to get their way or to get through with whatever they were and to get ad admissions out of other people. And of course, in the process of finding out whatever it was they were trying to find out about you, they frightened you into implicating other people so that they could later go get the other people. And their motivation in this was to stamp out evil and heresy in the church. The whole object, generally speaking, of these religious purges is purification. It's a striving for religious purity. Now, it's one thing for you in your own life to be striving for doctrinal and spiritual and religious purity in yourself. But when you begin to strive for it in another person, you know, here's a person here, a person there, and I want to try to achieve purity in you as opposed to in me, some very dangerous things begin to start taking place in people's minds. So these people would, would be taken in. They would be interrogated. And then they would be told that they were going to be tortured. They might as well tell the truth now, because they were going to tell it sooner or later. They were then taken and locked with their feet in irons and their ankles in irons for three days, in which they, nothing was done to them. They were allowed to contemplate what was coming. And this, frankly, was one of the most diabolical things of the whole thing, because you can conjure up in your mind greater pains than anyone can ever inflict upon you in actuality. The fear and the anticipation of torture was a horrible thing. Then on the fourth day, someone would come in and just show you 
the instruments of torture. They wouldn't do anything to you even then. They would just show you the instruments of torture, and then they would go away and leave you for the remainder of that day. And you were allowed to contemplate, once again, what that meant. Only on the fifth day did actual torture begin. And even then, it was quite restricted. Uh, it was to be done in such a way that no visible or outward effects were left. In other words, they didn't mar the face or anything of that nature. The object was to, in, to inflict pain, but not to inflict death. And this was to go on as long as it took before the person told them whatever they wanted to know. Now, if you think about this for a while, you begin to realize that they almost never failed to get a confession, right? Because the person would sit there and say to himself, Okay, I can confess now, and I'll be burned at the stake. Or I can confess at the end of the interrogation, and I will be burned at the stake. Or I can refuse to confess. I will be interrogated and tortured for a period of time, and then I will be burned at the stake. The end is all the same. It's what am I going to do in the meantime? And so the result was it was really relatively simple. People just basically coughed up what I said, whatever it was the Inquisitor wanted to know, because this was one of the ultimate good guy, bad guy techniques. But the Inquisitor was never there while the torture was going on. This was carried out by the secular arm, as it was called, by the army or by the government of the time. They took the person, they submitted the torture. When the Inquisitor arrived, they left. And it was only when the Inquisitor there that the person was left free from pain. And so consequently, a terrible bond developed between the poor victim of this and his inquisitor. And inevitably, he told the inquisitor whatever the inquisitor wanted to know. Now, this is why I say that, relatively speaking, the things that we have suffered, the indignities that we might have been put through, or little problems that we may have had with the church when we were disfellowshipped or put out, really, as a, put on a historical scale, they really don't amount to very much, do they? It is really no big deal when it comes down to the to the real bottom line of religious oppression, what it has meant in the history of man mankind down through all generations. All this is very effective at maintaining control and domination. Now, in the first century, it was really not much different from that. The Jewish leaders, as a matter of fact, sometimes had recourse to the secular arm. The truth was that they actually used the secular arm to crucify Jesus Christ, didn't they? It wasn't the Jews themselves. Their hands were relatively clean. They let the Romans do the actual crucifixion of Christ. So they occasionally used the secular arm to enforce their will upon other people. One of the things that I have always found is fascinating, I won't turn to it today because we've discussed it at great length in sermons before, is the incident where Jesus healed a man who was blind from birth. The stir that this created at that time is really astonishing from any perspective you want to look at it. You would think, of course, that healing a man born blind from birth would be cause for great celebration and excitement and, and marvel and wonder and glorifying God because it isn't just that Jesus did it. It's obvious that if a man was healed that way, God had to be involved in it. And you would think that would be the course of action. But it created enormous con con uh, consternation among the religious leaders of the time because it posed a threat to the status quo. So they called the man in, and they called in his parents. And they said, now, is this your son who was born blind, and by what means does he now stand before us whole? And they say, well, uh, he's our son, and he was born blind. But I can't tell you anything at all about how come he is the way he is now. And we are told that these people were actually distancing themselves from their own flesh and blood because they feared the Jews. Because the Jews had said that anybody who confesses this man will be put out of the synagogue. Now, that had apparently some rather severe consequences. We're not dealing immediately with murder, but murders did take place. People were dragged out of the city and stoned to death during this period of time, weren't they? People also were severed and cut off from friends and relatives. People did suffer serious economic dislocation from these because business ties were broken. And people who normally might have been the source of a great deal of their income and their livelihood, staying alive, in other words, no longer would have anything to do with them. That's happened to people right now in the 20th century, where not only have they been cut off from the church, their business income, their livelihood has been interfered with by people who do it for purely religious means as a part of a program of maintaining control of people. So religious oppression is nothing new in the world, is it? 
and is not something that just suddenly came on the scene or not something that was on the scene in Christ's day and disappeared and came back recently. There has never been a decade of man. There's never been a year. There's never been a month. There's never been a week that has gone by without someone engaging in religious oppression at some level, at some degree, of some other poor human being. The Jews, as I said, repeatedly tried to kill Jesus. He had to actually, apparently, miraculously find his way through them on a number of occasions. And then, of course, there's the stoning of Stephen, who was a man who had performed miracles. And, and you might ask, well, for which of his miracles did they stone him? I'm not for any of those. They got him out, and they, and they hired a couple of witnesses against him. They actually paid men to lie about what Stephen was doing in order to neutralize his effect in Jerusalem at that time, to call him a blasphemer and to prove it. Now, this is the ultimate insanity. This is the absolute ultimate insanity. I say insanity because some people would call it absurdity, and it is, but when absurdity is carried far enough, it is insane. Think about this for a moment. Truth is important, isn't it? Truth is precious. Truth is the greatest gift that God has given to mankind. We must preserve the truth at all costs. We must do whatever is necessary to protect and defend the truth. Even if it is necessary, I will lie to protect the truth. Do you see the absurdity in that? How can you lie, tell something that's not true, to protect the truth? You have made yourself into some sort of God. You have, you have actually usurped the authority and the prerogative of God. For it is God who, who, is, the, who is truth, who is love who tells us the truth, who can defend the truth. And the fact is, the truth needs no defense. The truth is like a great, huge, giant mountain of granite. It doesn't need any defense. It can defend itself quite nicely, thank you. It has been there. It will be there. It has always been there, and it will always be there. So when we decide we have to take drastic action and break God's law in order to defend the truth, we're crazy, just as crazy as a bed bug. And a person who thinks in terms of lying to protect the truth is the craziest of all. And so these men stoned Stephen. And they were intelligent men. They were men who normally, you would think, would have been able to have exercised the power of reason to have defeated Stephen, to have quoted Scripture, to have analyzed his argument. Now, you said this, but this is true. And then you said this, and that conflicted with that. But they had tried that, and it had failed. And when it failed, they killed that man. So I don't know that we need to worry that much about some of the things that we have been through, except perhaps to learn a little bit from them. Now, the church came into existence against a background of religious oppression. I think it's important for us to understand this, if we're going to understand some of the things that was done. There was a tradition of intrigue, of politicking, of backstabbing, and in this case it wasn't just figurative. In some cases, somebody literally got stabbed in the back. All of it in the service of God for the purpose of suppressing error, of condemning heretics, of blocking away people who posed a danger to the poor dumb sheep of the congregation. It was against this backdrop of religious oppression as a part of the history and the tradition not only of mankind in general but the Jews in particular that this church came into existence. The idea was to protect, to enhance the truth, and incidentally to maintain control over the religious institutions. Now, unless we understand this background, we cannot hope to appreciate the feelings of the New Testament writers when they spoke of the liberty that they had in Christ. You know, you just can't know what it meant. You can't understand what was going on down in the bowels, you know, in the, in the heart of the being, when a man who had lived in this, this, this climate of oppression, when a man who all of his life himself had been a factor in that oppression, as Paul had been, suddenly now came to realize it was all unnecessary and just cut all the strings. And all of this idea that I've got to defend the truth or I've got to look out for somebody over here because he's defending the truth and all of the politics and the intrigue and the struggles and the fighting and the death and destruction, they said the liberty, the freedom, that we have in Christ is a thing most precious and very precious indeed that it is. I think it's difficult, as I say sometimes, for us to understand the, their feelings in this regard. Now, I want to, let me illustrate what I mean. If you turn over to the 14th chapter of Acts, I'd like to try to show you what I'm talking about. Paul and Barnabas have been on a trip. They took off from Antioch 
they were commended to this trip by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And the, the, all of the brethren in Antioch had laid hands on them and commissioned them to it. And really by that laying on of hands, it almost sort of figuratively said, we're all with you in this enterprise. And they set out. They went over to Cyprus and then up into Asia Minor. And they went and, and raised up some new churches and ordained elders in all those churches. And there was a lot of excitement in the things that had been done because not, they, first of all, went to the synagogues and they were rejected. Then they preached to the Gentiles, and they were accepted, and the gospel was going out and win ways and with power it never had before, and everybody was getting very excited about what was happening in the church. Now beginning in verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Athalia. And they sailed from there to Antioch, from where they had started all this, from which they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they got there, they gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles, and they abode there a long time with the disciples. Now, there was a period of time that passed here when they were all just as happy as a bunch of clams. They were, you know, there was no big, you know, they, nobody was bothering them. Uh, they were preaching, they were studying God's Word, they were learning, they were sitting around and talking about it, and they would rehearse the things that had been done up there, and someone would have a question, and they would rehearse it again, they would analyze it for them. Somebody would ask, well, how does this apply from a prophecy? They were just having a ball up there. Something would be happened, though, at this point, because while they were having their ball up there, naturally the good news traveled down to Jerusalem about everything that had been done. And some thought began to go around down in Jerusalem, and some people came down here. Chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, well, then they determined now that the, they, in this particular case, would have to be the collection of brethren in Antioch made this determination. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other men should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So they, the Jerusalem conference is set up. And so they, being brought on their way by the church, passed through Phoenix and Samaria and declared the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared everything that God had done with them. But that there had rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, saying, it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, they get involved in all of this, and I don't really believe that Paul understood fully what was happening here at first. I think that he got blindsided. That happens to us a great deal. Uh, you know, because here we are merrily going on our way and doing our thing and rejoicing in the work that God is doing and, and you know, having our Sabbath services and our potlucks and the things that we enjoy doing together. And we're not sitting around trying to figure out how to cause somebody some trouble. And then a trouble arises, and you, you sort of are, are caught unawares at the moment or, or sent back, and you, you think, well, uh, uh, what, what, what do you want to do? I mean, how do we approach this, and how do we cope with this? And Paul didn't really know what to do. He dis disagreed with them. He felt they were quite wrong, and they went back and forth. And finally, everybody said, well, look, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's get a delegation together, and Paul and Barnabas and the others, and let's all go down to Jerusalem, and let's discuss this matter, and let's get it solved. Now, this is, seems, it seemed to them at the time to be a good idea. There is no record that anybody ever did anything like it again, because I have a feeling most of them were, so, were a little bit discouraged and disgusted by some of the, the, the uh, things that fell out of it and decided it was not really a very good way to carry on their business as a church. So it's the first time and the last time that there ever was a big Jerusalem conference over a question of doctrine. Now, as I say, I don't think Paul fully understood at the time what was going on, but after he had been to Jerusalem and after all the goings-on had taken place, Paul did understand, and he writes his analysis. Now, what you just read was Luke's analysis, or really just his factual account about what happened. If you want to read what Paul said it meant, turn over to Galatians, the second chapter, for here we find his analysis of what all this meant. He says, Then fourteen years afterward I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. I took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation, and I communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither, this is parenthetical, this little thing about Titus, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. He said they didn't make him do that. That's there because it's relevant to the letter. He says, 
and that. Now, by, by the and that, he is referring to the trip to Jerusalem to communicate with the apostles and elders, right? Are you with me? He says, okay, we did this because the false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now, verse 4 is so outrageous that we are usually inclined to play it down, a little bit tempted to play it down. We don't stop and look at that verse and realize what Paul has said. I say outrageous, because what he says here is that these people were unawares and were brought in privily. The Greek word is very similar for both these words, has the same initial root, and the word is stealth. Stealth. You've heard of the stealth, the stealth bomber and so forth, and basically it means secretly. It has to do with intent. You don't sneak around accidentally, do you? When you sneak around, you're trying to avoid being detected, avoid being seen, avoid being known. Stealth means I'm trying not to be detected. Paul says these people were, one, false brethren. They were claiming to be brethren, and they were no brethren of any of the people there. Got me? That he is not saying that these are just well-meaning, but deceived, uh, you know, and, and confused brethren of the church. He says they are not confused brethren. They are false brethren. Have you got that? That's a serious charge that he's making here. Like I said, it is so outrageous, we tend to play it down when we read over it. Let's don't play it down. Let's realize that Paul knew what had happened by the time he wrote Galatians, and he's calling a spade a spade. He says they were false brethren. They came in stealthily. They actually, as it says, were brought in, which implies a conspiracy to get them there, doesn't it? There were some people who worked around and intrigued to get these people up there. Now, I think when you look at that and you understand what Paul is saying about that, that is a serious charge. Because of false brethren stealthily brought in, who came out stealthily to spy out. There's a, a harsh word again. They're actually spies that somebody has sent up here to this area. Now, I've read this a lot of times and haven't really quite gotten the full meaning of it because of the, you know, the, the words that we use today and the words they use back there oftentimes don't mean the same thing. And the clue to this, and I hadn't seen it really quite the same way before, is the conclusion of this verse. The purpose was that they might bring us into bondage. Now, the word bondage, as I think all of us understand, is derived from the Greek word doulos, which means bond slave. In other words, a person who is a slave to another person. You've got shackles on him or or he's tied up, or in some way he is bound or held. He is not free. He has to do what he's told, go where he is, get up when he's told to get up, go to bed when he's told to go to bed, work where he's told to work. He is a slave. Now, the word bondage, which is derived from that, the literal sense of it was to be a slave. The metaphorical sense of it, however, was not quite the same. Metaphorically, it had to do with being controlled or held by or influenced or, better yet, probably dominated by another person. Now, in a mod those people in that time, using the term bondage would have been useful because they could look around and see people who were in slavery and, in an analogy, use things that people can see to explain things that they don't quite see or to, this is the use of a metaphor. Well, now, if you were using this term today, it really doesn't quite come across to you the way I think it ought to come across in explaining to you what was going on. What the word really means, and probably and you, can, you can translate the word this way anywhere you find it in the New Testament, this word bondage, translate it as domination, and translate it that way in this verse, and let's see how it reads. He says, that because of false brethren, stealthily and deliberately brought in, who came in with stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us under control, bring us under domination. And you suddenly understand what this is all about. What, what this was all about was the fact that there were those people unnamed in Jerusalem, who felt that Paul and Barnabas were out of control and out of line. Nobody from Jerusalem had told them they could take that journey up into Asia Minor. Nobody in Jerusalem had authorized them to go to the Gentiles. They were not circumcising the Gentile converts. They weren't doing things the way they were supposed to be done. But more important than any of that, they are out of control. And Paul's response is, these people came up here as a part of their, you know, you, again, realizing the background, the backdrop of intrigue and of manipulation and of, of, of backstabbing and politics that existed. 
that all of these people who came over into the church brought that background and that methodology and that way of going about doing things right in there with them. And it wasn't just Jews who did that. Every kind of religious people have tended to do this sort of thing, of trying to dominate and to control the people who are around them. So they came into the church, and they tried to do precisely, exactly the same thing all over again. Actually, another thing to understand is that, and this is a mistake I think that we have tended to make, because we are out of touch with the first century mentality, we oftentimes interpret these things in some rather bizarre ways. Paul is not talking about these people came up from Jerusalem, mistaken people, to try to teach a doctrine that would bring all of us into bondage to the law, some abstract concept of law. He is talking about not an abstract, but a real bondage or domination, not by the law, but by people. And that's different. For you see, the objective was not merely, in Paul's eyes, a sincere desire to teach the law to people who needed to know the law. The real objective was to try to get people under control. Now, he said it's a real domination by men that Paul is objecting to. It was nothing more or less than a, than a bald-faced power play in the early church. Now, notice verse 5 for confirmation of this. Paul says, To whom we gave place, and the word in Greek for give place is yield. You know, he said, To these people we did not yield... In subjection, no, not for an hour, because you see, this was the objective. The question is, will Paul yield? Will Paul come under subjection, or will he not? That was the bottom line. Paul says, I went down to Jerusalem, we talked this whole thing over, and we had to do it because of false brethren who were spies, who came in stealthily, pretending to be something they were not, in order to find out what we were doing so they might get us under control. But I have not yielded to their control for an hour, and I refuse to be dominated by them. Does that make sense? To understand what Paul is saying that way? Because this was a battle Paul fought over and over and over again. There was always someone trying to get Paul under control, because Paul was a man of his own. He had a mind of his own. He was aggressive. He was pushy, if you will. He was irritable, if you will. And a lot of people didn't like him. There weren't very many people, frankly, who could coexist with Paul. He had people who loved him and would die for him, and he had people who would hate him and kill him if they had half a chance, and there weren't too many people in between. And so the battle was joined with these people at this time. The word yielded, the word subjection, the words dom domination all tell us precisely what was going on. Now, you may have noticed that I have not discussed the doctrinal question that was raised in Jerusalem. Was there was a doctrinal question that was raised. I didn't even discuss it as I went down through it, not even continuing right now on through book, the book of Acts to go into the question of, of justification or of salvation. I'm not going to get involved in the rest of the book of Galatians and deal with all the complicated doctrines of justification that are presented there because, you see, doctrine was not the real question. This was a political issue disguised as a doctrinal issue. Paul tells us that in Galatians. He says it was clearly a political issue they came up and made a doctrinal issue out of it, but the doctrine was not an issue. He was forced. He was trapped, really. I don't, as I said, I don't think he realized what was happening at the time. It was only afterward that he realized what was going on and was able, and that's the way it usually is. You know, when you get through with something like this, you look back and say, boy, I wish I could have seen at the time what was coming down. If I had, I would have handled it differently. But well, Paul is no different from the rest of us. He didn't know what they were doing. They did. It was only with that good 2020 hindsight that Paul finally came to understand clearly and distinctly what these people were up with. They had made a, a, a doctrinal issue a big thing to cover up the real underlying political issue. Now think about this for a moment. Pure doctrinal questions that are purely doctrinal and nothing more. They just have to do with the doctrines and the practices of the church. They are interesting. They are stimulating. They are actually, a conversation about a doctrine like that is really quite comfortable. It's the sort of thing you can kick your shoes off and have a cup of coffee and, uh, and put your feet up and get your Bibles down and sit there and talk back and forth by the hour and just really have a good time, isn't it? You know, a pure doctrinal issue. Things that are just things you'd just like to understand better. And, and maybe you and I don't see eye to eye on it. Let's get our Bibles. Let's sit down. Let's talk about it. Let's see if we can come to understand this whole thing better. They, by and large, work out real good. In fact... 
I would say they're even fun to discuss and to research, just pure doctrinal questions. Now, when they are not fun, when they're not comfortable, when they're not interesting, stimulating things that you can enjoy, then I think you need to look out for the underlying political issue because it will be there. Just mark this down, another one of Dart's axioms, you know, your book of Dart's Collected Sayings. That when the doctrinal discussion is not comfortable, when it is not stimulating and interesting and fun, when it's not enjoyable and you still like each other and you're just enjoying the interchange of ideas, when tension begins to build, just step back for a minute and take a look for the underlying political issue. I promise you, it will always be there. Because that's where the tension and the struggle and all that comes from. And so I'm saying all that to work my way around to saying that liberty, that is freedom, Christian liberty, was the central thing. So It was so strong and so powerful an idea in these people's mind. The reason it was was because of this backdrop of intrigue and politicking and power and control and sometimes even blood and death that surrounded issues of religion. You know, of, that ought to have to do with kindness and helping people and, and being giving and generous and loving, they often wound up in situations where people found themselves dead as a result of the conflict. Liberty was central to Jesus' method, message. If you'll turn back to Luke, the fourth chapter, Luke chapter 4, verse 17. Jesus had come to Nazareth. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. This is one of the very first times that Jesus had something to say publicly about his message and his ministry. There was delivered to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives to recovery of the sight to, to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are bruised. Absolutely central to Jesus' message and the things that he was going to be teaching was freedom, deliverance to the captives, uh, deliver, I mean, let, being set free to those that are bruised, liberty, being turned loose, very much heart and core. Paul, because I think he himself had been an oppressor, actually took up this theme and, and proclaimed it probably more strongly than any other of Jesus' ministers. If you'll turn back to Galatians again, to the fifth chapter, I'll show you what I mean by the way in which Paul took this theme and, and pressed it and, and, and tried so hard to, to help the brethren to understand it. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with a yoke of domination. Now, this is, a, I choose the word domination here very carefully. I think it's very important for us to understand that this is what's talked about. For the law of God itself can never, all by itself, be a yoke of bondage. For that law just simply is there. It's like something that's been laid out here on the floor. And you can walk over to it, and you can pick up something of it, and examine it, look at it, and decide, well, I'll carry this. You know, I'll put it in one of my pockets. You can pick up another thing, and you can drape it around your neck and say, I'll carry this. You can walk a long ways, you can say it's too heavy, and you can take it off. So as far as the law it's to itself is concerned, and you and the law, the law can never become a yoke of bondage unless the law is imposed upon you by somebody. You follow me? The law itself can be taken or left. It becomes a yoke when somebody takes a hold of it and imposes it upon you, and you can't take it off. Then the law becomes indeed a yoke of domination, but the domination is not the domination of the law. It's the domination of men who are attempting to apply that law in a way they have no business doing in your life. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and don't get tangled up again in a yoke of domination by someone like this. I, Paul, say unto you that if you're circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. I testified, you know, he goes on with the argument about, about circumcision and so forth. And again, I don't want to get involved in the argument of doc, doc, uh, doctrine because doctrine is not the issue. The issue is who is going to dominate who as far as God's people are concerned. He says then in verse 13, For brethren, you have been called to liberty. You've actually been called to liberty. Only don't use that liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. 
Paul wanted to encourage people to understand that they are free in Christ, that they're not under domination to somebody or some organization or some structured thing of human beings are going to try to impose their ideas and their beliefs and their politics on you. In chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, he says, chapter 8 and let's begin in verse 8, meat commends us not to God. He's dealing with the question of meats offered to idols, but only indirectly because what he's really driving at is the question of avoiding offending people. But he talks a lot about meat offering to idols. He said, meat doesn't commend us to God. If we eat meat, we're not going to be better. And if we don't eat not, or if we don't eat it, we're not going to be worse. He said, but take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours should become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Because if any man see you who has knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him that is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And through your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. This is interesting because here again is Paul with this dominant concept of liberty, this awareness that you don't have to do something just because I say so. You know, I can stand up here and flail away and pound the pulpit about meats offered to idols and this sort of thing, and I can tell you all these things. And you can go out of here and you can say to yourself, well, you know, meat's nothing. Idol's nothing. I mean, I know better than that. I mean, I'm not worshiping the idol just because I eat a piece of meat that was offered to an idol over here, and I'm hungry, you know, and, and that meets half the price of what I would have to buy if I went over here and bought it somewhere else. And you can make all these arguments about it, and I think Paul say, okay, fine, you got that liberty. There's one thing I want you not to do, and this is an, a, a concept that, that I think sometimes by those who preach liberty is often ignored, that along with liberty goes a corresponding responsibility. He says, okay, you've got a certain amount of liberty. I want you to understand something. Don't use this liberty to an occasion for the flesh, and don't let this liberty of yours cause a weak brother to stumble. Now, he works his way around through this whole argument on meats offered to idols, and eventually tells you you shouldn't eat them. You know, you, you, at first glance, you think Paul is saying that it doesn't matter. Later on, he tells you, oh, yes, it does matter, because the things that were offered to these idols were offered to demons, and I don't want you to be the partaker of the Lord's table and the table of demons at the same time. He says, don't do that. But on the other hand, if you think you've got liberty, let's at least from this point of view understand this. Be responsible for that weak brother. But you see, that's a burden that you have got to pick up. It's not a burden that I can impose upon you. And that's what liberty really is all about. 1 Corinthians 9, just over the page. Paul says in verse 18, What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself the servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Interesting. Free from all men. But I have made myself the servant of all men, that I might gain the more. What does this mean, free from all men? And if that's true of Paul, is that true of me? Is it true of you? Why not? Well, sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. If the Apostle Paul could stand up here and say, look, I am free from all men. Do you have any idea what a powerful statement, what a tremendous departure that was in his day? You and I take it for granted. I mean, our country's had liberty. We've been free from all men for 200 years in this country. And we can wander out in the sunlight. We can go as we please. We can jump in our car and go rolling down the highway at 55 miles an hour and, and, and do just fine. And we can go wherever we want to, wherever we've got enough money to pay the gas and take us there. And we could get busy, two or three of us, with our credit cards and a little money. We could be in Alaska here in a very few days. We're free. We can do that. We're free from all men. It wasn't so, so much, at least in many aspects of their life in this first century. They'd be arrested without charge, held without charge, beaten without charge, and in some cases put to death without even any recourse to a judge. Talk about freedom. Free from all sin. hope so. And I hope you understand that you're free from me. I mean, you can listen if you wish. You can hear if you wish. You can respond if you wish. And therefore, I am free to exhort and to, you know, to, to uh, preach, to teach, to rebuke, correct, and so forth. And you're free to just sit there and say, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. And if I'm not clear enough, and if I can't support it in the Bible, and if I can't make you see it, then you have every reason to say that you don't think I know what I'm talking about and to go out of here and do as you will, please free to do that. And you can sit there and say, he does know what he's talking about, but I'm not going to do it anyway. And you're free to walk out of here and do as you please. And that's, that's incredible when you think about that. Now, should it be that way? 
I mean, is that, am I interpreting Paul correctly when I say he says, I am free from all men? But you see, no, he, he said, I am free, but I have picked up the burden of making myself a servant of all men. Nobody made him do it. He said, I have accepted that burden. Isn't that interesting? Now, he does say earlier that he has the responsibility and a commission to preach the gospel. He has a command. He said, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. But there are a lot of ways to preach the gospel. Paul says, what's my reward? So I can make the gospel without charge. He said, I am free from all men. Now, does that mean he's free from Peter? Is Peter a man? Then he's free from Peter. Does that mean he's free from James? Is James a man? Does it, what about Bartholomew? What about Barnabas? What about Timothy? What about all these people? Was he free from them? They meant, yep. Then he was free from them. Do you understand what that means? That means there's no human being on the face of this earth who has the right to tell you what to do. Now, you may have to face up to the fact that if he's got the power to make you do it, you may wind up doing it. they got the power if you drive 70 miles an hour down this road and you don't have any identification. They have the power to take you down and put you in a jailhouse. But you're free to do it, aren't you? Nobody's going to stop you before you do it. Nobody's going to put you in jail because they think you're going to drive too fast. They're going to let you do it. And then if, you, if they happen to be there in the right place, they're going to arrest you. And if you don't have any identification, they're going to take you down to the jailhouse. And they'll give you, a, you know, whatever it takes, a quarter to make your phone call. And that's it. Hope you find somebody at home. There's no telling where you'll be for, and for how long you'll be there if you don't find somebody that will answer. Hope you don't get a wrong number and use up your quarter. I don't know if they'll give you another one or a second one or not. But here we are, understanding, I am free from all men. You understand what I'm driving at? What I'm trying to tell you is that the bondage that is being talked about in the Bible is not a bondage to the law. It's a bondage to men. It is a domination by men. It is being controlled and influenced by men. It is doing things because men tell you to do it rather than because it's right. And because God tells you to do it. And his law instructs you to do so. And because you have voluntarily reached out and taken a hold of God's law and said, I will, Lord. I will, I'll do what you want me to do. I will pick up your burden. I will put on your yoke. And I will wear it because I know you. Not because somebody else insists that I do it or will take sanctions against me if I don't. That's what it means to say, I am free from all men. I have picked up this yoke and I may take it off. If I wish. And you can't change that. You have the same right, and I can't change that. That's what he means, plainly and simply. Doesn't mean there are any consequences. Doesn't mean there isn't a right and there isn't a wrong, because there is a right and there is a wrong. What it means is it's up to you to do what's right. Not up to me to make you do what is right. You are free from me. If that's the way things are, that's the way, the only way I ever want them to be. Romans 10, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 10. He says in verse 28, or actually verse 27, If any of them that, that believe not bid you to go to a feast, and you are disposed to go, whatever is set before you, eat it. Don't ask questions for conscience' sake. But if some man says to you, this is offered in sacrifice to idols, don't eat it for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake, because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say... Not your own, but the other man's. Okay, you will ask, well, then why should my liberty be judged by another man's conscience? Here's that word liberty again. You have liberty, you know. He said, you're, you're disposed to eat? Go ahead and eat it. You have the freedom to do that. He said, but on the other hand, he said, why should I be judged that way? If I, be, by grace, be a partaker, why could I be evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Whether, therefore, you eat or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God and give no offense, not to the Jews, not to the Gentiles, not to the church of God. You do it or you don't do it voluntarily. And you do it or you don't do it because you don't want to give offense to God's people. And that is a burden that you willingly pick up. That maybe on occasion you decide to have vegetables right along with your brother who is a vegetarian. And you willingly pick up a burden that you do not have to carry in order to help him, or to work with him, or not offend him, or cause him to stumble and fall down. You can eat You can eat meat. You can go right ahead and eat that big old steak, and if you know it's not going to offend him, go right ahead. The time may come when you're out to dinner with a, a, a new person in God's church, and you know he is offended, mightily offended by alcoholic beverages. 
And you may decide willingly to pick up the burden of not having a drink that night. If it is a burden to you, maybe you ought to look at yourself very carefully in the mirror tomorrow morning. But you willingly pick up the responsibility of not drinking because it might cause offense. That's your decision. You are free to do that, and you're free not to do it. All Paul can do, all I could do, is to exhort you as to what would be good and right for you to do. Probably the most dramatic illustration, though, of this whole concept is back in the book of Romans. And I want you to go back there with me because there's a, a lesson here which, for some reason, seems very difficult for some people to understand. Now, I'm not going to engage in any doctrinal discussions about clean and unclean meats or any of this sort of thing about fasting and not fasting or vegetarian or non-vegetarian. Because, again, what's important we're talking about here today is not doctrine. What we're talking about here today is liberty. We're talking about freedom and how that freedom affects the way you and I actually function together as brethren in a, the community of the church. All right, Romans chapter 1, sorry, chapter 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive you, but not to doubtful disputations. A very simple statement. I mean, that is about as clear as anything could possibly be. What he is saying is there are going to be people in your midst who are weak. How many of us are there here today who are weak, I wonder? Anybody here weak? You know, any weak people here? All right. Uh, whoever you, these weak people are, uh, you can look around and figure out for yourself who might be weak and who's not weak. Maybe just look at yourself and say, I know I'm weak. All right. We got some weak people here today. Weak about what? Doesn't make any difference about what. Didn't say about what. He said, he that is weak, receive. Receive? Do you mean to tell me that I am to allow weak people to come to church? Well, if I'm not, you all might as well go ahead and leave. You know, and I'll be right behind you and we'll lock the door because there's no none of us here that are not in one way or another weak, right? Awful lot of us couldn't be here if we couldn't have any weak people here. All right, he said, receive them. And then he goes a little further and he says, but not for the purpose of arguing with them. Now, some of us are happy to have weak people come in so we can get right to work on them. You know, here he is. Boy, I'm glad he's here, because now I can get a hold of him, you know. I can take him off to one side. I can drag him down to the local bar and grill, that grill down here, and I can explain to him why it's right for him to have that drink with me. Right? Wrong, alcohol breath. <laughs> That's not why you are supposed to receive the brother among our midst who doesn't believe it's right to drink alcohol. That's not why he's here, and that's not why you're supposed to receive him. You're not even told why, just receive him. That's all. Now, Paul goes on to explain, and he gives an illustration. He just picks something out of, the, out of the air. For one believes he can eat anything. Another who is weak eats herbs. Let not him that eats despise him that eats not. Let not him that eats not despise him that eats, for God has received him. And Paul's not talking about whether it's right or wrong to be a vegetarian, whether it's right or wrong to eat meat, whether it's right or wrong to eat clean and unclean meats, for that matter. He's not even into that, brethren. What he's saying, if there's somebody here who believes that way, leave him alone. Receive him, but don't create a lot of doubts in his mind and arguments over it. There will be time enough for him to learn. We can all learn and we can grow together. We're bound to have one of these days somebody show up in our midst who believes it's perfectly all right to eat pork. What are we going to do? Just try to beat him over the head with it? Now, I would hope that he would have enough respect for us that he wouldn't bring a big old Virginia ham to the potluck. But if he believes that way, our job is not to cause doubtful disputations in his mind. We are told, receive this fellow that believes he can eat anything, but not for the purpose of a lot of arguments that might arise. He then makes, to me, one of the strongest statements, one of the clearest statements, and one of the most often violated principles in the entirety of the New Testament. Who are you that judges another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, yea, he shall be held up, for God is able to make him to stand. Isn't that beautiful? Who, you know, here is somebody in here who believes that he really it's, he shouldn't eat meat, that he has a set of arguments that he learned somewhere about vegetarianism and going back to the Old Testament and, and prior to Noah, and he can, he can put all these things together for you, and he believes that he's a vegetarian and he shouldn't eat any of those. Who is his master? Isn't Jesus his master? You certainly aren't, and I certainly am I'm not. Now, the question it is asked is, who do you think you are to sit in judgment of another man's servant? Because, see, he doesn't belong to you. He belongs to Christ. This is what Paul is saying, isn't it? Is, is this not the whole thrust of the Scripture? 
whose servant are you? Well, you see, if I am the one that is the arbiter of all this, and I insist that you cannot come here unless you are not a vegetarian and you understand that it's all right to eat meat, then have I become your master? Am I the one that determines your relationship with God? Whose servant are you? Interesting question for all of you. I want you to think about this one for the question of one man esteeming one day above another and another man esteeming every day alike uh, comes up, you know, here immediately following in the book of Romans. Let's suppose old Lewis back here had a job as a bus driver down here in Longview. Happens to drive a bus. And he basically, year in, year out, has to work until 5.30 on every afternoon. And all through the summer, that's all real good. As a matter of fact, it's been real good up through the feast time. Now we're coming down to that time of year, though, when the sun is setting right at 5.30. And the week, next week, it's going to be setting about 5.25. And the week following at about 5.15. And then it's going to be 5. And we all know that old Lewis back here, we all know better, than we, but, but we, in this particular analysis, we're going to imagine that Lewis is working 30 minutes into the Sabbath every, every week, you know, all week, year long through the wintertime. That's what he does every week. And about a half dozen or so of us in here, in here know that. And among that half dozen or so of us in here who know that, there are a couple of us that are bothered by the fact that Lewis is doing that. Now, see, we don't have any idea about Lewis's problem. We don't know that Lewis, by this time, may have five children. This, this is an imaginary Lewis. That uh, he's got a house payment that he can barely make. And he doesn't know how to do anything else but drive a bus. And he's afraid. He's afraid. Just plain old afraid. He loves God. He knows God's law. He knows it's not best. And he's made some problems. He's rationalized it around. He's, he, but he's a responsible man, you know. He's not the kind of man that's willing to walk away from his family or to take a chance on his family winding up on welfare or take a chance on somebody taking one of his children away from him because he's not feeding them. He says to himself, I, I, I don't know what to do. You know, he's thought, thought about it. He's prayed about it. And he's arrived at a very uneasy compromise with God and his own conscience, and he's living with it day in, day out. Who are we to go to him and tell him what he ought to be doing, to bring pressure to bear upon him? Who are we to threaten him that he cannot come back to church unless he solves that problem? I want to ask you something. If we take a man in that situation who is unable to muster up the faith to do it because God says so, and we step into it and we threaten him with excommunication of the church unless he does it, and then he does it, he's actually done it because of your and my pressure, when he wouldn't do it because of what God said, he will do it because of what we threaten what have we accomplished? Can you tell me what we've accomplished? Have we really gotten anywhere? Have we turned a Sabbath breaker into an idolater? Have we done any more than that? The truth is that what we've done, we've turned a Sabbath breaker into an idolater, and we have not solved any problems whatsoever. For if he only does it because we say so and not before because God says so, he's been corrupted, and we've been corrupted by what we have done. We don't have any business trying to play God with people's lives. He, Lewis, our imaginary Lewis, is free from all men. If we try to take that freedom away from him, even the freedom to sin, the freedom to compromise with God's law, the freedom to struggle with a question of the, the difference between two evils in his view, where he has to make two very bad decisions and he chooses to make it the best way he knows how and prays that God would forgive him. Who are we to play God? Who are we to stick our nose into that and start asking a lot of questions about what he's doing? We have no business. Paul says, Who are you that judges another man's servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. In fact, he will be held up, for God is able to make him stand. We've got another fellow, shall we say, an imaginary fellow attending with us, and his attitude isn't as good as Lewis's. He just hadn't got it sorted out in his own mind, just isn't sure it's right, never has really, you know, not settled in his own mind about it. And he goes ahead and breaks the Sabbath kind of carelessly, frankly. Who are you to judge another man's servant? Who are you to judge whether he's careless or intent or whether his attitude is good or whether it's not? You see? Because God will make him stand. He may have to get some sense into his head. He may have to put him through some adversity in the process. 
And when, the, when, and when this man's life starts coming unglued on him, when God decides to turn him over his knee and begin to chastise him, and things all start going wrong and he begins to worry about what's going wrong, would he be better off attending church with us or isolated from us with none of us speaking to him? Well, I don't know. I think he'd be better off here, don't you? I think it would be better for him when things start going wrong if he were here. Because you see, if we've told him not to come because of his problem, we've added one more problem, one more obstacle, put one more layer of bricks on top of the wall to him coming back. We've made it more difficult because of his pride. You say, well, he shouldn't have that pride. Oh, big deal. Neither should you. But we do. We do. And whatever, whether he should have it or not, you and I should not be laying that extra row of bricks in there to make it that much higher for him to get over to come back to God's people. You see, more harm is done by people not minding their own business than you could ever imagine. And the sad part about it is it does it probably every bit as much harm to the person who's not minding his business as it does to the person who's afflicted by the interference. You want to know how to lose your freedom in Christ? Start interfering in somebody else's life. Start trying to run somebody else's life. Trying to show somebody else what they ought to be doing and ought not to be doing. And all of a sudden, you've lost an awful lot of your own freedom in the process. You deserve it when they call you up at 3 o'clock in the morning saying, What shall I do? You know, I've got this problem. I don't know. There goes a lot of your freedom right out the window. Are you sure you really want to try to direct or help or encourage somebody else to do the right thing and all these things? I could go on with other illustrations. There's the question of new moons, you know, that we could argue about, that we could have a person among us who believes they ought to be kept and a person who shouldn't. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, and the bottom line of all this thing, and, and Paul isn't saying in this, in this that we shouldn't grow in knowledge, that we shouldn't come together, that we shouldn't discuss and try to come to understand God's truth better. What he's talking about is how we act while we're getting there, how we behave toward one another while we're trying to learn, while we're trying to sort a lot of these difficult, difficulties out. I wonder also how far would we go in attempting such enforcement? How far would you go? Would you go so far if a person had that problem? Now, you know, it's one thing to go to him and sit down and say, look, I, I don't want to be judging you. I just noticed something, and I'm just wondering if I can be of any help. That's one thing. Would you go so far, though, as to try to bring pressure on to say, look, if you don't get this sorted out, you can't come back to church. Now, we all know that's been done, don't we? We know that where people have been smoking and had a problem with that. We say, look, you can't come back to church until you quit smoking. Okay, well, they may have quit at 2 o'clock, you know, or 1.45 when services begin at 2. Can they come back? Uh, uh, you know, you get all these problems that people have, but you can't come back until you quit smoking, or you can't come back until you stop working on the Sabbath. And so he said, well, I didn't work this week. Can I come? Well, yeah, and you're not going to work next week. Well, how do you know what a person's going to do, and how can he know what he's going to do? And so I go, what, how far would you go? Would you put a person in prison for breaking the Sabbath in our world today, you know? Would you go so far as to kill? People have. What's the difference? Well, it's a difference of degree, certainly, and there is definitely a difference between disfellowshipping someone and killing somebody about not keeping God's law. But there is an underlying principle that is still both there in both cases, and that is the unwarranted interference in a, in a Christian's freedom, his liberty in Christ to do or not to do. Now, other biblical writers who didn't have Paul's experience write with a certain amount of caution about this matter of liberty. Peter writes and says, don't use it to, as an occasion to the flesh, and don't turn that liberty that God has given you into license to do what do as you please. Uh, James refers to the perfect law of liberty. He identifies clearly the law of liberty, that which really is, makes you free, is the Ten Commandments. So it's not, a, it's not a, again, a liberty from the law. James abhors that idea. Peter re re rejects that idea. And Paul rejects that idea. It's just that Paul is so powerfully moved because he himself took the liberty away from so many people that it's a very strong concept in his own mind. Now, I said earlier that the law itself is not a yoke of bondage. But attempts to enforce the law can, can quickly become a yoke of domination. The Pharisees had made it so. What do you do, or what you do, of your own volition is not a yoke of domination, is it? 
What you decide to do, what is your choice, what you want, is not a yoke of bondage or a domination. Now, in conclusion, turn back to Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. That is a beautiful saying. It's one of those things that made into music and carried on, but I emphasize the word me in there very heavily. And notice, notice Jesus says, you take my yoke upon you. I, he doesn't say, I am going to place my yoke upon you. He says, you Take it. Now, in order to put a yoke upon yourself, you've got to be able to pick it up. It cannot be too heavy for you to lift, can it? You've actually got to be able to lift it and get your legs into it, raise it up and put it on your shoulders, and you have got to be able to carry it. Some people are stronger than others. Some people can carry a greater weight than others. And Jesus said, promises that he will never put a load upon you that you can't carry. And that in itself is a, is a tremendous promise. But he says, take my yoke upon you. Now, the next thing he says is why you should do it. He then proceeds through and says, For I, my yoke, take my yoke and my burden, for I am meek and lowly. Now, this is very interesting to me, because what he is telling us is that the example he sets is the example of a servant, not a master, is of one who is giving, not taking, of one who is easy to be entreated, not harsh and, and unresponsive. The point is that when you sit down with a teacher, a teacher can be harsh, a teacher can be hard on you, a teacher can be demanding, a teacher can lay burdens upon you, he can be arrogant, he can be hard to live with. Jesus said, no, no, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and you'll find rest to your soul." You're not going to find yourself in agitation and, and frustration and aggravation and argumentation and struggle and, and worry and frustration and fear because of what people threaten to do and what they, you're afraid they might do to you. You shall have rest to your soul. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light.